entrepreneurship, education, collaboration, and engagement. And many of you know that in école in French means schools. So it's a, it's a great coincidence. Let me start by saying what école is not. École is not another network of higher education institution. École emerged from the experience that the OECD Center for Entrepreneurship SMEs Regions and Cities has developed by working for over a decade on entrepreneurship education and universities third mission as a major contribution to two OECD official bodies, the Local Employment and Economic Development Committee and the Committee on SMEs and Entrepreneurship. And over that time, we have partnered with the European Commission, uh, we have partnered with the Inter-American Development Bank, and we have partnered with the Economic Research Center for Asian and East Asia, uh, and we call it uh, IRIA. And we have worked also uh, directly with hundreds of higher education institutions in three different continents, Europe, Latin America, and Asia. And in doing so, we have seen the importance of entrepreneurship education, not just as a tool to drive new firm creation, but as a mechanism to develop entrepreneurial mindset. Entrepreneurial mindset that can drive innovation in firms, entrepreneurial mindset that can drive improvements in higher education systems and institutions themselves, entrepreneurial mindset that can help drive inclusive growth in our local economies. So because through entrepreneurship education, students develop an understanding of how to experiment, innovate, deal with complexity, as well as the softer skills they need to succeed in the today's economy. And these transferable skills are valuable to students and the business community, of course, even if they do not go on to found uh, their own business. For higher education institutions themselves, entrepreneurial education offers the opportunity to innovate in teaching and learning practices, develop their own future leaders, and bind them more closely uh, to the local business community. So by doing uh, so, it can bring in new uh, thinking and ideas, establish new partnership, and generate additional resources and impact through joint ventures. For local economies, entrepreneurial education does not just help add to the skills base and business population, but it also provides a critical path to opportunity for the most disadvantaged group. And our work on missing entrepreneurs has shown the importance of entrepreneurship opportunities to these groups and the role of higher education institutions in opening up these opportunities. However, to engage universities and harness their potential, it's really important to acknowledge and understand their own internal challenges in terms of governance, in terms of uh, resources, uh, and in terms of incentives. Our work on the geography of higher education has shown, for instance, that while higher education institutions can have a hugely positive impact on social and economic outcomes of regions and local communities, too often their funding and incentives <laughs> instead depend on much more narrow measures of research uh, excellence. And this needs to, to change. Uh, it cannot continue like that. Entrepreneurship education can bridge this gap by helping research excellence find an outlet in new uh, business opportunities and enterprises. And to promote this change, entrepreneurship education needs to extend beyond business schools or specialized network. It needs to be more accessible and embedded throughout uh, university teaching. Again, not because we believe that everyone should become an entrepreneur uh, founding the next unicorn, for instance, but because we believe that entrepreneurship education can really empower all individuals and be better prepare them for the future of work and the future of our society. And we know how much today soft skills matter for all type of companies, big, medium, and small. And to make the case for this, we need to develop a better understanding of impact. So as interest has grown in uh, entrepreneurship education, so too has the diversity of uh, approaches. 
now often including business placements, uh, incubators and uh, accelerators to put theory into uh, practice. We need to generate and share knowledge about these different approaches and what works. Uh, Ecole looks to provide higher education institutions and their partners with an international platform to do so. And part of the strength of this network will lie in its diversity, cutting across uh, disciplines and bringing higher education institutions together with firms, with policymakers, with banks, and other type of uh, uh, financial institution and with regional and local authority. And this diversity is really uh, reflected in today's speakers that represent uh, regional government, international companies, students, of course, the financial sector and the civil society. So ECOL will not be an elite club. We will not uh, have select members, but we will have rather committed partners. We're looking for committed partners who really understand the importance of collaboration to address the economic, environmental, and societal challenges that uh, we face. And to ensure that ECOL generates uh, activities and knowledge that are relevant to partners, the network will be based on task and finish groups. There will be diverse groups focused on the shared challenges identified by partners. And we will start, for instance, immediately with a group focused on the role of higher education in regional innovation. This will support uh, recovering plans and build on our work on smart specialization policy. And the OECD uh, CFE team will be the organizers, the facilitators, and the disseminators of these task and finish groups. And we will build also on our research, including on higher education institution, including on local entrepreneurial ecosystem, but we also rely on our broader OECD bodies uh, uh, that are uh, actually uh, the country delegates from the two committees I just mentioned, but also our uh, network in CFE, like the local uh, employment and economic development forum and our network of entrepreneurs and small business owners. So now I'm going to stop here. Let me hand over to uh, Rafael Trapasso. Uh, who is actually uh, one of the architects of this wonderful initiative. He will introduce the panel for uh, today's event. I said one because actually the whole work started a very long time ago under uh, the leadership of Jonathan Potter. Uh, so uh, these two men, you know, they make it happen for the first time. You know, uh, we don't have a woman, but I know there are many ladies coming up to join, uh, to join this group. And of course, they have uh, Celine Kaufman who oversees the whole work. So um, I'm very excited about this, uh, this new project. Um, I'm very excited about uh, partnering with all of you. And I wish you a, a good discussion and, and all the best for your first day of uh, ECOL. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lamia. Always uh, uh, great uh, having uh, you with us. Uh, first day of ECOL, uh, a lot uh, of uh, things to discuss. Uh, a new world is emerging from COVID, and our ambition is that ECOL can contribute to uh, this new world that is emerging from the pandemic. Uh, please, uh, thank you very much for being with us. You can participate to the discussion in the Q&A function and also in the chat. We have uh, my colleagues, uh, Maria Sobron and Giorgia Ponti, monitoring uh, the discussion in the chat. I saw there are people connected from all over the world. Thank you very much for being with us. We will try to uh, involve you in a Mentimeter uh, process to understand what, at the end of this uh, discussion, what are the key topics that you would like to see uh, discussed uh, within uh, ECOL. Now, we are blessed by the participation of very important experts, stakeholders of higher education institutions. Uh, let me briefly introduce uh, them. We have Sheila Martin, who is the Vice President of Economic Development and Community Engagement at the Association of Public and Land Grant University, APLU, in the United States, Sheila. Tim Ackerman, that is the head of global talent acquisition and engagement at the TUI group, so tourism from Germany. We have Marcus Buchhorn, 
who is the Director General of the Asia Pacific Advanced Network, APEN, uh, connected from uh, Australia. Uh, Simon Edstrom, uh, who is president of the Swedish National Union of uh, Students. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Matthias Rodriguez Inciarte, who is the chairman of the Santander Universities and vice president of Universia Santander. Uh, and then we have, uh, last but not least, uh, the regional minister uh, Fabrizio Sala, who uh, is regional minister for research, university, and internationalization at the Lombardy region uh, in Italy. Uh, we know that Minister Sala has some uh, institutional commitments, so we will start uh, uh, with him in, in this uh, uh, round tables of, of question. Uh, so, uh, Minister uh, Fabrizio, if I, if I may, uh, you are uh, in uh, the well, one of the wealthiest regions uh, of, uh, of the OECD, and uh, it would be very interesting for us uh, to understand uh, uh, what role university play within the regional economy uh, and society uh, of, of Lombardy. Fabrizio, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Trapasso, and uh, good afternoon, everyone, or uh, good morning, uh, good evening, good night. Uh, first of all, uh, as you suggested, uh, I, I'd like to spend a few words about uh, Region Lombardy. Uh, it represents uh, one-fifth of uh, Italian GDP and one-third of uh, national uh, exports. It is, uh, in fact, uh, the driving force uh, behind uh, Italy's economy and uh, industry, and uh, one uh, of the most uh, productive uh, regions in Europe. We are uh, 11 million inhabitants, and uh, we are home to more than 800,000 companies and 60,000 new businesses are registered each year. Lombardy among uh, the Italian regions uh, is uh, one that uh, invests more in uh, innovation. Businesses are uh, uh, research and uh, universities. The region vocation for uh, innovation is uh, supported in fact by its uh, highly developed system of education and research. It counts 13 universities, hundreds of private and research centers, 12 national research council institutes, 18 university hospitals, and six science and technology parks. Innovation and research are key elements to make a difference and to create growth and productivity in the business system. Region Lombardy is in fact uh, committed to promote a further cooperation between the companies, university, and uh, the public research institutes. We are working so hard to support the promotion of regional dig digital innovation apps. We have uh, two consortia under development in key priority areas such as manufacturing and the life sciences. Through a strategic involvement of the most relevant stakeholders in the field and with the final aim of developing a new solution for the benefits of our citizens who are the core of our policies. For this reason, we have decided to bring together the stakeholders through the so-called clusters which are, in other words, a union between companies, university, research center, and other both public and private entities. Thanks to these clusters, today we are well set to boost the establishment of new value-added manufacturing facilities to attract young talents and encourage businesses to invest in research in Lombardy. Clusters actually make a great setting for the sharing of technologies. They provide an environment where knowledge, research, and insight can, can come together with the technical and manufacturing capabilities that make it possible to advance technology in order to solve critical challenges. 
We are uh, also well aware that uh, our future, including the economic one, begins uh, in our university. This is why, after the hard times we had to face due COVID-19, we have decided to invest a lot of resources for research in innovation and university. It is about 90 million euros and over half, so 50 million, are destined for university. This money is intended for advanced digital, digital tech teaching projects and also for innovative development projects. Let me share with you some examples of the first results of this project. It's about new data centers, new system to innovate the digital factory, and again, a new quantum communication network around Milan. Our universities are recognized among the best in Italy and also the international rankings. Their efforts make me very proud. Because, uh, as I've said before, uh, our future passes through here and uh, it is vital for the institution to create a, a fertile ground in which they can increasingly develop. It. This is our policy, but uh, maybe we can uh, get a closer look inside later uh, in the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sala. Very interesting. Super interesting, this idea of regional clusters. Uh, I think that uh, resonates very well with the discussion that we are trying to do today. And diversity. And I want uh, to discuss diversity with uh, Sheila Martin from APLU. Uh, Sheila, uh, APLU is a, a very important uh, uh, network in the United States. And uh, uh, I would like to know uh, in which way appeal you promote diversity in the university networks and uh, in which way this diversity helps you deliver your objectives? Sure, thank you, Raphael, and welcome to uh, colleagues around the world, um, whether it's morning, afternoon, or evening for you. Um, APLU is a research policy and advocacy association that works to strengthen and, and advance the work of public and land grant universities in the US, Mexico, and Canada. Um, we have over 240 members, so our membership is quite diverse, ranging from very large public universities to much smaller institutions. As part of that work, we manage a community of practice called the Innovation and Economic Prosperity Universities Program. And that community of practice is comprised of institutions that have made an institutional ongoing commitment to economic engagement with their communities. And we support them in doing that work and we frame that in three elements, talent and workforce development that aligns our learning mission with the needs of the local economy, innovation, entrepreneurship and technology-based economic development that contributes to the growth and evolution of the local economy and place-based engagement with local community governments and NGOs that contribute to the quality of life in the communities where we live and where we serve. So we, as I mentioned, we have large, very research intensive universities that you would have heard of like the University of Minnesota with over 60,000 students and over a billion dollars in research funding. Um, places like Purdue University and MIT and the University of Washington, all common uh, names that you probably have heard of. But it also includes much smaller regional universities such as Northern Illinois University with just over 20,000 students and over 20, and $25 million in research funding. But the diversity in our membership also includes universities that serve a large number of low income students and students of color, such as Alabama A&M University, which is a historically the black college with an enrollment of about 6,500 and almost 70% of those students are low income. So we also in our network of innovation and entrepreneurship universities, we welcome non-APLU members into our ranks. And that means that we welcome very small institutions, private universities and community colleges. And we have participants in our events that include those members partners 
such as local governments, non-government organizations, and economic development associations. So that diversity helps us in at least three ways. First, um, we a large research intensive universe. It helps us it helps us to understand how um, the more complete ecosystem and how different types of institutions play different roles. So a large, very research intensive university might play the role of the development of technology and the spin-offs and startups that, that bring that technology into the region and spawn completely new industries. But there are smaller institutions that do very applied research that is also very important to the adoption of new technology by industry. So they may help them solve engineering problems. And some of those more less, or those less research intense universities and the community colleges can be very important in terms of training the graduates that enter those industries. And, and of course, we know that the most effective form of technology transfer is when our students bring that technology to the companies that they work in. So that's the first benefit is um, that, that um, understanding of how different types of institutions play different roles in the innovation in ecosystem. The second benefit of that diversity is that it helps us understand how best practices in economic engagement can be applied in very different background conditions. So do these best practices apply widely or should we recommend a different approach for different institutions? How might, we, how might that approach differ for an institution in an urban setting um, or an institution in a remote rural area? What about institutions that have very limited resources versus those that have large endowments? How might we be able to foster an innovation and entrepreneurial mindset even in the face of constrained resources. Even the largest, um, most research intense institutions have a lot to learn from all smaller institutions who are often very innovative in their approaches precisely because they are resource constrained. So that's the second benefit is this understanding of how different background conditions affect the different um, uh, understanding of, the, of how to apply these best practices. And the third benefit of having this diverse community of practice is that individuals in our cohort, in our community, they meet people they might not otherwise uh, meet and they find common ground. And sometimes those institutions, those partners, they, they become partners in um, ways that they might not have expected. They might find a way to write a joint funding proposal for an applied research project. Or they might find that um, like we have several institutions in our cohort that come from the same region and they haven't worked together before. And they, as a result of being part of our cohort, they began working together on regional ecosystem building projects. Um, and they originally connected around these topics through our network. So, um, so that is, those are the three benefits of having those, that diversity in our network. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila, also for your time uh, uh, management. Uh, there are questions, including for you in the Q&A uh, you know, part. We will try to address this question at the end of the first uh, round of, of questions. But if any of the panelists wants to engage with the question in written, please uh, go, go ahead. Uh, uh, thank you, Sheila, because uh, this, uh, this idea of diversity and uh, uh, food chain, if you want, in the ecosystem and the importance of understanding the ecosystem, so the background conditions are fundamental issues that we found many times in our work promoting entrepreneurship education. And, and, and then this, this, this idea that generation of innovation is important, but diffusion of innovation is also very relevant. Uh, diffusion of innovation to, to benefit uh, a business and uh, Tim, Tim Ackerman from uh, TUI, uh, you represent a business, you represent a, a global business that deals with a sector that was highly affected by the COVID pandemic and now is what we hope uh, all bouncing forward very quickly. 
Um, and, and Tim, you, you are uh, in, in your role of uh, head of global talent acquisition. You cooperate with several higher education institutions. You inform the program programs, uh, the, the, the curricula that they pro the curriculum that they produce. But can you tell us in which way cooperation with universities is important for business besides talent? Tim, the floor is yours. Thank you, Raphael. I was just thinking besides talent is uh, rather difficult because everything's linked to talent and universities where well, they produce talent, their factory. So um, there's <laughs> everything's linked to it. But um, also, maybe to start in the beginning, as you might know, or as you know, at least, uh, I'm not only um, in the corporate world on the uh, business side, I'm also lecturing at the university myself. And I have a, so a small side business, so I'm an entrepreneur myself. So I might have three different perspectives um, with my answer. Um, but starting with that, besides talent, uh, and obviously universities are a, a huge source of talent, I would say that uh, major reasons for us to cooperate with higher educational institutions are again, linked to talent, um, get innovation into the company uh, through talent mostly, because uh, again, we are hiring graduates, um, but uh, with a different perspective, maybe just in having headcount and people. Um, but it is really important for us to get um, the latest, at least in some disciplines, the latest, what is out there in science and uh, business models, um, finance models. So all these kind of things, it's uh, one thing which we're always aiming at. We're also doing that not only through um, hiring graduates or having internship programs, but uh, for us, it's also quite important to um, send our people uh, to universities to also lecture. To, so to, it's a bilateral process uh, for us, it's quite important. And also not only sending our people, but um, in discussions with universities also influence a little bit of their curriculum. I know that um, and it's a very German thing, it's a freedom of science, but nonetheless, you have discussions with universities and you try to, well, at least let them know what you find interesting or topics you would like to see or what you would like to see in future graduates coming out of university. So that's a very important thing. Um, so um, we're not shy with that and uh, universities shouldn't be shy in asking us maybe. Um, and um, so this kind of exchange is really, really important for us. Um, and also I have to say, because I, I saw it um, in Ecole's um, mission statement, uh, regional development, because um, also uh, business, uh, specifically larger business like multinational corporations say nowadays, put a large focus on CSR, corporate, uh, corporate social responsibility. We have uh, the TUI Foundation, which does a lot of regional development. So specifically also in tourism, we're trying to develop our um, markets. Um, so help them um, grow. I also know that from my past employer, like Lidl, for example, we're doing a lot of things um, in, in um, countries in Africa where we try to develop those countries. And it's also something when we cooperate with the universities locally, uh, we try to improve regional development there as well. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Tim. This this idea of commitment at the regional uh, at the regional level uh, of business uh, is is very relevant and it would be uh, one uh, I'm sure one of the foci of uh, of our uh, activities with uh, with the call, and uh, uh, this idea of uh, the relevance, uh, if you want, of the impact of uh, uh, universities, business, this this knowledge triangle is uh, also one of the main uh, drivers of uh, uh, the work of uh, Santander universities, uh, uh, I, I know. And uh, uh, Matthias, uh, Matthias Rodriguez Inciarte, uh, chairman of Santander universities. Um, you have a, a, a very privileged uh, viewpoint, uh, Matthias, because uh, you uh, cooperate with uh, a, a large number of universities, higher education institutions uh, in, uh, in a large part of the, of the world. Uh, what is uh, that you are seeing in uh, higher education institutions that is evolving? Uh, what is the, the, the experiences that are, are more significant for you in this uh, in these last uh, last years? Matthias, the floor is yours. Thank you, Rafael. I'm very pleased to be part of this important discussion uh, led by Cole. So I, I congratulations to you all for this initiative. In fact, Santander uh, has been involved uh, with universities for many years, uh, more than 20 years. We have uh, one sort of another of agreements with over 1,400 uh, universities all over the world. 
that gives us a, a very privileged position of uh, having a, a vision of what the universities are doing and doing it from the uh, private sector angle. So we are not looking at the universities like they may look uh, and themselves from uh, the in, in, inside, but having also a look from the business world of what the universities uh, are doing. I, we have seen over these years a huge transformation of universities, the priorities of, of uh, universities. Universities are these days less of a kind of ivory uh, towers in which uh, uh, disconnect from their environment but they are closer and closer to the regions uh, in which they are operating and, and going in directions that are very much what the world requires uh, today. For instance, uh, in our agreements with universities, we are focusing in three uh, uh, important areas. One obviously is equality, education, uh, scholarships, all matters related to uh, helping universities uh, uh, promote equality, and access to, to, the, to education. There is another uh, line of work, which is entrepreneurship. And we have developed uh, 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 throughout this network of universities, uh, programs that uh, uh, try to expand what the universities are doing in terms of entrepreneurship by not just having a specific units within universities, but also promoting that uh, entrepreneurship is some core matters that the universities are looking at. And the third line of our work is employability. Uh, jobs are changing all over the world and we have to keep pace with these fast changing uh, demands in the labor work uh, uh, world. Uh, there is a study at the World Economic Forum that if we close the skill gaps in the world, we will be able to add uh, 11.5 trillion uh, uh, US dollars to the GDP by 2028. That means the importance of, uh, uh, of uh, education and bringing the, this uh, gap in order to promote uh, growth, which is one of the themes that we are uh, discussing uh, today. So in my uh, 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 view, universities are doing the right approach. They have a huge challenge. They have to to uh, make their own internal transformation, uh, uh, a fast competing world because there are new entrants, so to speak, in the world of universities by, by uh, uh, credentials, boot camps, and other ways to compete with the traditional education by universities. But at the same time, they have to be close to the demands of society, uh, promoting this kind of programs such uh, as entrepreneurship within the universities and also looking, having, uh, I mean, a closer view to employability, which links to themes, uh, themes uh, such as uh, lifelong uh, uh, learning or upskilling or reskilling, which are uh, fundamental in the world uh, today. I would stop at that and uh, I'm more than happy to develop some of these ideas in a colloquium afterwards. Uh, thank you, Rafa. Thank you, thank you, Matthias. This uh, was very was very interesting. Uh, the, the 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 point is that uh, we had this discussion uh, a while ago, also with uh, one of our invitees in, in the geography of higher education uh, webinars about the importance of not wasting talent. And I think that team uh, teams and yours. Uh, uh, intervention go in, in, in this direction. Uh, let's jump on the other side of the world where it's already Friday night. Uh, Marcus, Marcus Buchhorn is the Director General Asia Pacific Advanced Network, APEN. Marcus, you were also one of our guests in uh, uh, the Geography of Higher Education uh, uh, webinars. And uh, there is something, a story that you told us uh, that struck me a lot about this paper written on nature by uh, about the Higgs boson written by more than 5,000 co-authors. Uh, does uh, open innovation, open science need uh, an end with uh, this level of complexity? Oh, um, so firstly, thank you, Raphael, for the uh, opportunity to speak in this very illustrious audience. And um, I, I have to deny that I'm any kind of an entrepreneur, but um, I've certainly worked with a few and I've met many academics who I believe could become entrepreneurs. Um, I think the, 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 the scale 
So I should explain where I'm coming from. Um, so APAN, Asia Pacific Advanced Network, is a partnership of literally network operators who support research and education across the Asia Pacific region. So we span from Pakistan in the West to Japan in the East to Australia, New Zealand in the South. Um, that's more than half the world's population, probably more than half the world's universities. And what we basically do is we offer through, through APAN, which is one of many organizations I work with, an infrastructure that allows researchers to collaborate and share. Um, it is a network that's parallel to the internet. It runs 100 to 1,000 times faster than the internet. And it supports a much smaller, more targeted community, that research and education community. And one of the things that's happened over the years is that research used to be this sort of small lab, small office, um, an academic sitting in a corner, working away on a problem, coming up with solutions, uh, winning a Nobel Prize for it. Um, the problems have gotten bigger and the communities of effort required to solve those problems have gotten much, much bigger. Um, so we're now talking about the grand challenge problems in research, you know, um, in, in, in climate change, in ecology and environmental changes, in uh, economic development, in, um, dare I say, this occasional virus that goes through. Um, you know, if ever there was a term where going viral was a bad thing, here's an example. And to basically solve those problems now requires a, a team of people. And that team doesn't necessarily just come from one discipline. They are now much more cross-disciplinary as well. So they are working across different communities. And they're not just working with colleagues in other universities. They're partnering with, with government. They're part partnering with industry. And so we're now seeing a much larger scale to research activities in general. Um, that, that paper I referenced, um, things like the, the particle accelerator at CERN in Europe there, um, a typical paper has over a thousand authors on it because there is just this huge partnership of people working around solving these huge problems and they need this large scale research infrastructure. And that's the community I, I work in a lot of my time, which is about linking the computers and linking the data and linking the people um, globally, you know, ignoring borders. Um, many researchers nowadays will identify when you ask them what they are and where they're from, they'll talk about their discipline. They, they can't remember which university they work for because they're just working with so many of them. They just happen to have an office in one of them. Um, so it's, it's quite a different approach that we have to think about now. And so we have um, a range of different approaches around the world where we allow people to collaborate and work with industry and to share that infrastructure. And, and predominantly it's, it's centered around the data um, and, and we're seeing this increasing driver from research communities around making data more open. We're seeing governments being driven to make their data more open. Um, some of them with more enthusiasm than others, to be honest. And we're getting industry involved in very good conversations. And I really liked uh, Tim's point about this, this influence that industry has about the, the, the guiding of the, the curriculum and the development of that. Uh, and one of the things I do on, you know, as, as one of my other projects is I, I teach at a university and trying to understand what industry is looking for and trying to bring industry people in to help with lectures and guide the curriculum and take people out and so on. Um, there's that really rapidly emerging, evolving, I think as Matthias said, um, universities are changing a lot in this space. So research is changing, universities are changing. And there's a whole bunch of things we could talk about maybe a bit later around, around the skills of the workforce in that. But I really want to stress the fact that research and research infrastructure and data is, is a global conversation now. Um, and it requires a level of intelligence and innovation and, dare I say, entrepreneurship to help build communities on top of that infrastructure. Um, and I can lay, maybe later on give some examples of um, research industry partnerships that have led to these sorts of things. But just to finish off, one point I would want like to make is if we look at um, what happens in APAN, when I describe it, I talked about it being a technology community. The biggest working group in APAN is agriculture. 
The next one is bioinformatics. The next one is um, telemedicine. Um, we have um, physics, we have e-culture, we have disaster management. Um, it's those user communities, it's those groups getting together. Um, and tying back to in fact, to Sheila's point, it's, it's building that community of practice, sharing information um, across this huge diversity. Think about the economic development across the Asia Pacific region, where we've got you know, very mature Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, Japan, and then we've got Nepal and Bhutan and Sri Lanka and so on, all of whom are members, all of them come to the table in, uh, in an equal conversation. And that's how we get to that sort of scale. Let me, th th let me pass yeah. it to you. No, thank you. Thank you very much, Marcus, because uh, at the end of the day, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's also a technology issue in the sense that you have a, 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 a supply of innovation, you have a demand of innovation, you need a platform that can match us that uh, uh, different uh, stakeholders, and, and this is super, super difficult and, and will require specific, uh, specific, specific thinking and activities. Now, uh, last uh, but not least, uh, Simon, thank you for, for being so passionate. This is a, a very uh, you know, dense uh, discussion. Uh, again, the president of the Swedish, uh, or former president for, uh, for since a couple of days of the Swedish National Union of Students. Uh, and, and Simon, we, we have uh, discussed uh, in, in, other, in other venues, in other uh, you know, occasions. Uh, and I'm always very interested about your vision of uh, what is entrepreneurship education from the perspective of students. Uh, Simon, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Raila. Pleasure to be speaking to you all. And thank you, the rest of the panel, for very interesting remarks. See, I've been working with these uh, issues as a representative for all of the students in Sweden for the last uh, two years or so. And I think it's always very interesting to hear from all of these different perspectives and what we would like to see. I think my main uh, lesson from these past couple of years is that I think it's very important to have both a holistic and end of mind perspective. So. What do I mean by that? I think very often <laughs> we don't really um, analyze all of the different components and say, where would we like to end up using all of these different components? Uh, for instance, say that we wanted to have a goal of you know, creating businesses that have a connection to research and education at the higher education institution, and that will be successful and be economically sustainable and not doing any harm to society. I think from that, we can start getting into lots of these different as aspects that we've talked about in the panel. You know, we need, we need entrepreneurs to start the business. We need students uh, who will have a high quality education, who have some specific entrepreneurial skills. We have, they have to have skills in society and sustainability but you know that's not enough because in order to create a business that will do stuff you need lots of people around you you need different support structures you need graduates from different areas and so forth you need faculty to support you and i think you know having entrepreneurship education is one very important piece of the puzzle but it is only one important piece of uh, the puzzle and then you know we also need lots of different aspects that we've talked about funding capital uh, incubators working spaces and really giving the students possibility to do all of these things and for me when it's worked the best is not only when it's the policy makers or you know one person who has this perspective that this is the uh, end goal and these are all the components they make up this but when all of the different stakeholders have the same understanding of the systems that are at play and the different uh, uh, aspects that are important. Uh, and, you know, th that was only one example of a goal you can have. I think the goal shifts very much uh, when, if you want to create, you know, small businesses which are bought up by larger businesses or, uh, you know, innovation within large existing companies that we've talked about or having innovation within the private sectors, putting up these different kinds of goals and identifying the different components of the systems will lead to very different different kinds of policy and collaborations. Uh, and I think it very much comes back to the question of are entrepreneurs created or are they found? And I would say that, you know, to some extent they can be found, but it is better that they are created. And uh, I think with some previous panels have touched upon that, but, you know, students should not be seen as uh, superhumans, but instead people with their dreams and ambitions that want to create something new in society. And we should create these individuals, but also enable uh, these individuals. I think I think also one previous panelist here said that you know universities 
are factories for talent. I kind of agree with that, but I think it's also very important that we do not think of students as some kind of unrefined raw mass of material that have to be sort of pushed through some machine and then we get a lump of gold at the end. Rather, students are individuals with their own ideals and wants and needs, and it's more about identifying what does our student group want and what do they need and what possibilities can they provide to the rest of society, not how do we form them into this a uh, nice puzzle piece that will fit in our puzzle. I think it's also very important, um, my final regard, to really think about the connection to research. A, a, lot, a lot of time when I speak to policies and uh, decision makers, they think that, you know, oh, we'll just have all these research, we'll have high ranking universities, we're going to get innovation and fantastic products. And that's really not how it works. Uh, as Marcus was saying, different uh, areas of research provide very different roles. Within my area, AI and robotics, the university's role is much more to just find what private companies have actually made and more about democratizing already known stuff so that that can create innovation. Uh, and within different research areas, you're going to have a lot of different purposes of what research actually is but it always comes back to having a high quality research centered education that allows good graduates to get out there in society and uh, make the world a better change, a better place through change. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Simon. This uh, make, make the world a better place was my line uh, through, uh, <laughs> through entrepreneurship. No, joking, but thank you because this, uh, this discussion about superhumans is very, is very relevant um, because I was in another, the panel the webinar like this on SDGs uh, earlier this week, and I had the feeling that there was a discussion about the next generation solving the problems uh, concerning uh, SDGs, uh, climate change, inclusion, inclusiveness. So I think that what we need is more an intergenerational pact. Uh, that recognizes the importance of, of course, talent, but also, you know, uh, sustainability in, in terms of uh, ideals, uh, ideas and, and processes. Um, now, uh, there are some Q and B before we go to the second round of our question, let me address some of the questions that I think are relevant in the Q&A uh, part very briefly. Uh, first, who can be a member of a call? Uh, everyone. A call has non members, a call has partners. And as uh, uh, Lamia Kamal Shawi clarified, we will organize our work based on task and finish groups. So there will be a group of experts, people, or uh, stakeholders working on specific topic identified by you that uh, concern entrepreneurship, uh, education, collaboration, and engagement. And these groups diverse will try to generate uh, common narratives and share the goals. Uh, this brings me to the second question I want to, I want to uh, address. Uh, there are already a lot of uh, multilateral organizations working uh, to better connect universities with uh, business, with uh, uh, in regional development, etc. Uh, we are different because the OECD is different. That we are not a bank, we are not a government, uh, we are offering our experiences in coordinating uh, complex policy dialogue with uh, different stakeholders at the international level. We think we recognize that this is important because many other multilateral organizations are working exactly on this. We think that the OECD is uh, the, the good place to push the frontier of the discussion a little bit uh, farther. Uh, now, the uh, second uh, round uh, of, of question, uh, as I said, let me start with uh, uh, Regional Minister Sala, who has to leave us uh, soon because of uh, previous uh, institutional commitments. Um, Fabrizio, if I may, uh, you, you mentioned a lot of interesting activities, the regional classes, you know, Lombardy is, uh, is very active. Uh, what concrete examples of regional policy promoting these uh, clusters and these uh, innovation plat platforms and linking universities, uh, uh, including students with business. Can you, can you tell us? Uh, Fabrizio, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you again. Um, as I said before, matching uh, uh, manufacturing with uh, innovation, research uh, and uh, universities, the permanent challenge that uh, our people uh, 
have to face and uh, Region Lombardy wants to help them to win with uh, this challenge. A clear case is uh, given by our agreements for research and innovation, which we have uh, refinanced this uh, year with 114 million euros. They are the result of uh, an innovative call named Collab, which is one of the first in Europe to has been made. It's about to encourage the establishment of innovation apps and to develop innovative solutions that can meet the real needs of citizens in order to improve the quality of life. New technology, in fact, are already shaping our lives and uh, will uh, ensure a competitive uh, development if uh, fully applied in the different sectors of our social and, uh, and eco economic system. Or again, the artificial intelligence application, for example, uh, have uh, the potential of uh, delivering uh, a wide range of positive uh, impacts uh, for people. I truly believe that uh, our actions should address the implication of new artificial intelligence technolog technological solutions and should implement them in our lands in a coordinated way, starting from schools and universities, of course. I will give you some examples to underline the aim of this regional initiative, which has already reached its second edition. Thanks to Collab, one of the largest 3D printers in the world will be built in Brescia, the second largest 3D printer in the world. And still new treatment system for degenerative and oncological disease have been studied. And again, new recycling methods will be made, new models of smart cities, Drones that will transport drugs and also smart labels that, uh, thanks to brand new sensor, will automatically change the expiration date of the products. If uh, we combine both uh, the edition of uh, the call, we are talking about 60 projects unique in the world made by the cooperation between university, companies, and institutions. This is an important strategy because uh, it is uh, crucial to make uh, long-term uh, choice and it is essential to promote investments in the key sector that uh, are becoming more and more important of us. We already focused on uh, a very powerful strategy about the open innovation, which is crucial to develop uh, relations of uh, cooperations between uh, the players of economic system. It is a sector that uh, we are implementing in uh, carefully because uh, it can be a turning point in terms of production and uh, our students' life uh, as well. One of, uh, of our latest uh, uh, projects uh, to combine the needs of a university with a business through institution is called the Open Challenge. And it is a section of our regional platform called Open Innovation. Open Challenge is a digital space where companies should make challenges with which can be related to productive area or can be related to critical issues. These challenges are addressed to the students of our university who can therefore find opportunities not only to work, but also to learn directly in the field. It's uh, almost a time now to skip uh, to the end and I want to do that, uh, to do that uh, with a message. I'm truly convinced that educational system. Fabrizio, we, there, was a, there was a glitch. Uh, we lost you. 
when you said I'm ah. truly I'm truly convinced and we were ah, okay I'm truly spending. convinced that the crucial achievements can be reached only by joining effort within all players starting from educational system thank you ah. Thank you very much. This is this is a, a very important message, and I think that uh, the universities in Lombardy are very lucky to have such a supportive uh, government. Our experience is that uh, uh, universities uh, are uh, there are not career opportunities, there are not incentives, uh, even when such an, an engaging regional government is there. Uh, the the possibilities are not completely uh, taken because of the limits of, of the system. Uh, Fabrizio, it was uh, it was great to to uh, Minister Sala. It was great to have you with us, and uh, we wish you all the best for your activities. And we hope that uh, Lombardy can uh, connect to our work uh, uh, with uh, Ecole. So see you soon. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. See you soon. Thank you. Uh, and uh, after Italy, uh, I would say that uh, uh, we can go to the United States to discuss basically the same issue, the way uh, Sheila Martin, the way in which uh, uh, universities and regions cooperate uh, in, uh, in the US and what can be done to improve uh, these uh, dynamics of collaboration. Sheila, the, the floor is, is yours. Thank you very much. Sure, thank you, Raphael. Um, the collaboration practices between higher ed institutions and regions, it varies a great deal um, based on the place and the university. And, and you know, the United States is a very big place and culture can vary quite a bit. Um, so let's take, for example, a very small community, place where I got my PhD, Ames, Iowa, at Iowa State University. This is a small, a pretty small town in a rural state. Um, the economic vitality of that region is very dependent on the university. Um, the regional university partnership is very close, very interdependent. Without the university, they would not have a very diversified economy. Um, so the, there's a lot of collaboration between the university and the private sector and with chambers of commerce. They try to understand the research and education needs of industry and respond to those. And those needs are often a result of the companies that are spun off from the university in their research parks and so on. And the university is very dependent on the town maintaining a high quality of life to attract faculty and students. So there is this, you know, very, um, collaborative, codependent co relationship. And um, so it is essential that they work together. And there are many small towns throughout the United States that have pretty good relationships in this way. Um, universities in big cities, the relationship can be much more complex. It can be very rich. So for example, where I worked at Portland State University, the university in the city um, when um, one of the presidents I worked for, Vim V. Vell, when he became president of the university, we uh, signed a memorandum of understanding between the city and the university. And they agreed to do joint research in areas that were important to sustaining um, the livability of the city. So for example, how can the research of the university help the city and the region meet their climate goals? Um, so we looked at public transportation, housing, we looked at issues around homelessness, and we have a very strong uh, research agenda around climate solutions. Um, but a huge challenge in either case, either the small town case or the large community case, is the change in leadership that happens among university leadership as well as among local government leadership. And so it's really important um, that these relationships survive these changes in leadership. And making sure that that happens means that you have to make sure that that commitment goes beyond just an agreement among those leaders. The commitment has to extend to the faculty and the students. So it has to be part of the identity of the university. 
And the community also has to have an identity as a learning community. And so that identity as a university that is in partnership with its community is part of what attracts students and attracts faculty to that university and creates a long-term commitment. And it needs to be based on a set of shared objectives, the desire for the university and the community to have a reciprocity in that relationship. Um, uh, and understanding that we need to learn from each other and that the university doesn't approach the community as we know everything. And we are going, we are here to, you know, in a relationship where we are, uh, we are going to teach you because we have a great deal to learn from our community. The universities have a lot to learn from their communities. But it also helps a lot to have an infrastructure that supports that relationship, like an office that coordinates um, these relationships and, and uh, develops a system for sharing information um, it, the, so that the relationship can be organized and the university understands all the different touch points that they have in the community. And that can be very tricky because individual faculty and staff, they envy their relationships with the community and they don't always want to share that information. Um, but there are, you know, universities can create incentives to, to coordinate across the campus um, to make sure that this kind of, um, so that we understand um, what we're doing in the community and we're coordinating and sharing resources. So another challenge, especially in larger regions, is that the relationship can become very complicated by the complex nature of those regions. So those regions themselves are made up with multiple overlapping local governments. And those governments have their own complicated relationships. And um, that can become very difficult to manage as the university is trying to understand the politics of those relationships among those local governments. And um, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that um, for, for now and see what comes up in the conversation. Thank you, Sheila. This, this point about the complexity of the multi-level governance in which uh, universities are embedded is, is very relevant. And uh, I think that comes to a key point in the sense that there are places in which the universities are landmarks and the relationship with authorities by univocal. And there are places uh, like Lombardy, where you have, uh, I don't know, 15 universities, and then the relationship with the hierarchy and, uh, and the political economy of reform of collaboration is very, is very complex. Uh, and, uh, and I also liked very much this, this point, and I saw John Godard, the Professor Godard saying, geography matters, and, and you said this uh, very well, and we, we also, with, with the help of Professor Rodriguez Pose, we have developed this idea of place responsiveness, at least in, uh, in, in universities, that I think that uh, is what you say, you know, that this idea that the, you are, you know, discussing with actors that are global, and uh, uh, local at the same time and have to manage uh, uh, to put together to connect this, this, these two di dimensions uh, efficiently. But uh, let, me, let me go uh, and, and take advantage of the experience of uh, uh, Matthias Rodriguez in Fiarte. Uh, Matthias, do you think that our uh, you know, endeavor <laughs> is helpful in a sense? Do you think that it's possible to create, to create uh, this heterogeneous network of higher education institutions and their stakeholders to promote entrepreneurship. Do you think that this is a good in initiative? Uh, uh, Matthias, the floor is yours. You're muted. I think it's an excellent initiative. Uh, uh, I think to, to make the best of uh, this combination with uh, public and uh, private sector and universities and the uh, regions and, and also the companies and the middle market. This is something uh, uh, very important uh, uh, looking forward. For instance, I, I see a unique opportunity of universities cooperating with the, with the middle market in terms of research, for instance, in which the dimension of smaller companies uh, don't allow them uh, to go and, and make this kind of uh, effort in terms of research. 
universities could cooperate with these companies, providing them with this uh, uh, kind of research to be applied effectively in their own uh, process of development. I mean, there are uh, enormous opportunities of working in this uh, direction. There are also, in terms of entrepreneurship, we have been talking about uh, the, the possibilities of cooperating, not just but embedding uh, the, uh, within the university this spirit of entrepreneurship, but also uh, 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 the, the uh, financial companies in order to provide the adequate finance to this project uh, being launched, which is also very important. But let me mention one thing that is not been uh, addressed in, uh, till now in, in, in this uh, uh, conversation, which is funding. I mean, I, I think it's extremely important uh, to provide uh, higher education and universities in particular with the proper funding to develop their function. In, in political terms, there is always uh, a great talk about the importance of education, but the means not naturally come together with this talk. And then I think it should be extremely important to address this question, maybe on a multilateral basis, and OECD is perfectly well placed in order to encourage governments to dedicate a percentage of their either budget or GDP or whatever to education. Otherwise, we are going to miss new opportunities because there are always a lot of uh, demanding questions uh, 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 that require uh, public funding. But if we don't invest in education, we are ready to miss this profound change that society is, 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 is now uh, uh, under. Uh, and also, there is an an another element, which is to encourage uh, cooperation among universities. The initiative by the European Union to promote this cooperation on European universities, this is something that maybe could be translated in other geographic areas because we think it's fundamental in, 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 in fields such as digital transformation to profit from the economies of scale and cooperation among universities. There are the, the themes that for me is very, very, are very important. Cooperation in universities, middle market in terms of research, this is one public sector funding for universities, another extremely important uh, uh, theme. The, uh, the, how to finance these proce processes of entrepreneurship are also a very important dimension. And last but not least, the cooperation among universities is, 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 uh, is going to be more and more important as our uh, digital transformation require a more and more investment in the future. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, much, Matthias. These are encouraging uh, uh, feedback for us because uh, uh, we think that it's important to uh, bring evidence and uh, uh, improve the uh, efficiency, if you want, of the, if you like, of, of the investment in higher education uh, uh, systems. Uh, and uh, we hope that ECOL can also do that. Uh, I, I will go back now to, t to Tim Ackerman. Uh, and uh, uh, I would ask you the same question, the other face of the coin. What is the role that you think that ECOL can have in the world of business? So from your perspective, do you think that there is a need for a common language and culture between higher education institutions and, uh, and businesses and that we can help that? Well, basically, that's three questions. Uh, two very easy to answer. One is a little bit more complex, and I can link it to what has been discussed before. So the first question, what role can you call play or have in the world of business? I think um, what makes a call unique is uh, the um, number of stakeholders you bring together. So you're not only bringing together higher education and business um, or higher education public institutions or higher education students, but you bring together all these stakeholders. Um, can I say what will come out of that? No, I can't, but we're talking about innovation. So it's good to bring them together and maybe we see what's coming up out of that. So uh, I think that's really unique um, uh, to the world of business. I haven't seen that before. Um, do I think there's a need uh, for, or is there a common language between higher education and um, business? I also think that's easy to answer from my experience over the last decades, it uh, uh, became more and more similar, the kind of language we are speaking uh, because 
higher educational institutions become a little bit more entrepreneurial and business oriented uh, and businesses became more and more and uh, pardon me if I use the word again, but talent oriented uh, or, or let's say learning oriented. So the language, uh, it, it kind of um, comes together. So I think also that is something which already is there. Can we still improve? Yes. The more complex and tricky question is a question of culture. Uh, and that's my, my personal um, remark to that would be, I don't want to have them uh, a similar culture than uh, corporations, and I don't want to have um, students or graduates coming out of uh, higher educational institutions which already think like business. Um, I also don't want to have naive um, people who don't have any clue about the world, but we're talking about entrepreneurial uh, skills. So it's really important for me that universities still focus on knowledge, on skills, on competencies, uh, and not um, that much about uh, how we can then pardon me again, exploit that in the economical environment. Um, and uh, Simon um, made a remark uh, uh, about me uh, saying it's a, it's a talent factory kind of. Um, yes, it is, but it doesn't mean that I, I want these kind of um, unindividualized same people. Um, but what we want is actually uh, what someone also in the, in the uh, comments said, uh, we want entrepreneurial behaviors, mindsets and capabilities. It's not um, uh, the opposite of uh, having of, of creating business and using these people in business because that's what we need. And obviously we need knowledge still. Um, so should there be a common culture? I would say, well, at least from that perspective, not that much um, because um, then we could also do the education ourselves. We could also build tons of minimis, and that would um, spoil innovation and entrepreneurial mindsets. So, no, <laughs> language, yes. Uh, thank you, Tim. This is uh, this is very interesting because uh, what we have uh, seen is that there is a lot of uh, uh, discussion about this uh, Uberization almost uh, of uh, higher education and education in general. Uh, these uh, all these. Uh, uh, you know, focus on uh, uh, micro credentials, on uh, et cetera, et cetera. But I, 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 I see your point, and I think it's very interesting. This uh, this idea of uh, skills bundles, in which you need to have uh, knowledge, uh, your own culture, and then all also. And this is the idea, probably. And I saw in the chat that there were some comments about that. Our idea. Of course, it's not that everyone should be a businessman or you know engage with a fa fancy startup. Uh, our idea is that entrepreneurship education is a, is a is a useful approach to stimulate the capacity of the students uh, to to get some uh, skills that can activate the knowledge uh, and uh, and uh, and then. Uh, um, also to, to, to generate uh, social capital, to generate networks, to uh, be able to connect with other people before they leave university. And, and so to facilitate that transition, not only towards the labor market, but also to society uh, that is, uh, you know, to, to have citizens, not only workers uh, uh, that, that can help, uh, especially with the complexity that we are, uh, we are uh, uh, facing now. Uh, if I can make one remark, sorry, Raphael. Go ahead, go ahead. Let's break <laughs> so the rules. Just to mind, it's still the same uh, topic, but um, uh, what uh, when I do accreditation of university degrees, um, what I always would like to see, and I think also from a business perspective, um, is an element of studium generale, uh, even in technical um, degrees or something. So uh, people need to become, or uh, well, if you're lucky, they already are when they join university, but when they get out of university, there should be personalities and they should have a broader view and have these kind of skills, but also are, should be able to adopt to other uh, disciplines rather than themselves. So they need to have a broader knowledge, uh, uh, just not their own discipline. Well, obviously you can't teach them everything uh, in, in one degree. Um, but um, in German, I would call it Fachidiot, uh, which is um, a specialized idiot. Um, so we don't need that. We need personalities. Yeah, I, I, I see your point. And hey, Marcus, I see that you are nodding on this point. So uh, I will uh, uh, now give the floor to you. Uh, what are, according to you, the endogenous innovation that will be needed within higher education institutions to create uh, this uh, interdisciplinary platform and cultures supporting uh, innovation, entrepreneurship? Uh, what is the connection that we will, will need uh, 
uh, to be established between uh, uh, STEM and uh, humanities, uh, and I wanted to to to, to uh, touch you on this on this question. The floor is yours. Thank you. And wow, that's three huge questions, I think, there. But um, I, I was just just thinking about uh, uh, Tim's point about the the fach The um, one one of the things in my courses I teach uh, is is around computer networking. It's very technical. I teach to computer science students. And I give them the job to design a network for a rural village. And it actually brings in economic factors and geology, and it brings in um, political requirements and so on. And the students really struggle with this until they kind of start to get it and go, hang on a minute, there are all these factors. And one of the challenging things is that in most courses that we teach, we, we teach that there's the right way or there's a right answer. And in that one piece of work, I can demonstrate there is no single right answer. There's, there's so many different ways you could approach the problem. Um, and so you, you, you have to try and teach a bit of plasticity almost um, to do that. Um, I think with the university sectors more broadly, um, and, you know, I take the point in some of the discussion in the chat too, um, they are huge tankers steaming through the, the Malacca Straits and getting them to change and become flexible and dynamic small creatures is really difficult. Um, and what's, what I'm seeing happening more and more is that the researchers are self-organizing in spite of the universities. Um, they are forming the partnerships of their own. They're bringing together their own communities around disciplines, around challenges, and going, hang on, we need to solve this problem. Um, and you know, taking your point in particular about you know, STEM and, and, um, and philosophy, um, there's, there's several centers I can think of now where machine learning and AI and all these things are becoming, you know, de rigueur for every discipline. And a lovely article recently talked about machine learning will solve COVID. And there are zero examples of that being successful so far. But there's a lot of examples of machine learning and AI being applied in areas in society broadly where it gets it wrong. Um, and so we now have these groups and these communities forming where we have machine learning, AI, working with ethics and lawyers and politics and humanities researchers and trying to understand why does the technology have human biases? Where does that come from? Why does that happen? How do we get around that? How do we fix those things? So I think there's um, a need for universities to think about how they've structured their silos, quite honestly. A lot of universities are quite siloed and quite um, barrier driven. You work in a certain discipline and it's hard to communicate across others. Um, I think there's a, a big problem we have and certainly in my community in the research infrastructure community, um, the workforce is a problem. Um, we don't have the people we need to support the researchers as much as they need. So they train their own PhD students and everything. And there are now jobs that didn't exist 10 or 15 years ago. Um, these, these are entirely new jobs and we're now trying to work out how to find these people, how to train these people, how to give them career paths. And, you know, I mean, trying to give them uh, an opportunity to grow and develop and start up their own organization. I, I don't want to go into the, the discussion in the chat about business type things, but even offering new services, new approaches to things and so on. That's actually quite difficult. And that's one of the things I would really like to see uh, in, in Nicole is, I mean, some of the, the references to some of the great articles and, and work already being done uh, mentioned in the chat there. Um, There's some really great work going on, but universities are not very good at capturing that and then sharing it and distributing it within their institution. They don't internalize it very well. So it does come down to key individuals, key groups, key partnerships that form. And how you operationalize that and sustain it. I think I forget who mentioned the funding problem. I think Matthias mentioned it. You know, that, that is a major, major problem for many universities. Um, I'm going a little bit off my turf here, but that's, that's kind of where I'm thinking at the moment. No, it's, it's perfect, Max, because, uh, and also in, in reference to Matthias' point, because uh, if there is need, there, there is path dependence, no? and you are familiar with this concept in the sense that we try to innovate in uh, a domain that is strongly uh, dependent on uh, his uh, past situation. And, and perhaps uh, we need to uh, innovate uh, radically to allow higher education uh, institutions and higher education policy uh, to respond to this uh, 
uh, expectation, needs, etc. And what we see is that uh, investing more in the current framework is not producing that change in terms of cultural framework, in terms of uh, institutions, incentives, careers, et cetera, et cetera, that is expected or even needed to respond to these uh, new questions that are emerging. So I, I don't want to say this is perhaps a little bit even beyond the, uh, the scope of a call. A call is really about entrepreneurship education, collaboration and engagement, not about higher education. There, there are other colleagues in USD uh, and we hope to, 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 of course, to, to, to develop collaboration with them. But I think that we can start triggering also a, a more structural uh, reflection on uh, higher education. Do you want to say something? I see that you were trying to, okay. And then, uh, again, last but not least, Simon, thank you for being so passionate. Uh, but uh, I, I want to ask you the more difficult question in the sense that also uh, reflected to what the, the, the speakers discussed, what is the magic wand? Uh, there is a magic wand question in the sense what you would do uh, to improve. The, if, you, if you could decide a call, uh, uh, to structure a call in a certain way, uh, what do you think that a call could do to help students play an active role in economy and society? Thank you. Simon. Thank you uh, very much for that very easy question, Rafael. Uh, <laughs> no, I think uh, I think it's a very good initiative, and my hope is that it'll lead to it'll lead to useful insights and you know understandings on a somewhat practical basis. I find the higher up you kind of go, you go from a course to a university to a country to the European Union to OECD, uh, the more difficult it becomes to become grounded in sort of actual useful uh, handy issues, uh, and that that's very natural because so many different countries we have so many completely different kind of values and structures and so forth i think the main thing with which ecole can contribute uh, with is finding some kinds of shared value shared sort of end in mind perspectives what would we actually like to achieve uh, getting more of mutual understandings between different actors i think Tim, you elaborated very good, very well on my uh, critique. And I really, I personally, I don't think it's that strange that, you know, businesses, of course, are interested in being economically sustainable uh, and making money. That's kind of the purpose of a business, but there should be something much more uh, than that. But it's, of course, impo important for all the other actors to know that in business, it's important to be economically sustainable. Otherwise, you don't survive. And you can have very many uh, similar aspects. Uh, I think within a call student representation, of course, I bring that up, but uh, I think student, in my experience, student representation often helps to kind of ground the discussions from an individual's perspective and see, okay, well, what's actually happening down there at the floor and how can we uh, help from that kind of perspective? So as long as the students are involved, I think it's um, uh, very, very uh, good. And I mean, these issues should never be seen as simple. These issues are complex. They uh, require a lot of different perspectives and a lot of different actors coming together and trying to find sort of common uh, themes and understanding in spite of our perhaps different values and uh, systems, I think is uh, very uh, important. For, for instance, in Sweden, we talk a lot about sort of social security and welfare systems and their relation to innovation. I mean, if you don't, it, 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 how can we minimize the risk to reward ratio with more carrots uh, than whips, so to say, because if you can take a much higher risk. You don't have to risk your children uh, not being able to go to higher education if you engage in some kind of innovation. Uh, you know That's probably an aspect which in Sweden is very important, but perhaps not all countries share that kind of uh, value and so forth. Uh, also with Mat uh, Matthias's point about funding before, I think it's really important to have perhaps less competitive funding because I see a lot of time we everyone we're just trying to maximize the utility of the university and we just try to increase as much competitive funding as possible and that reduces the amount of collaboration that's possible that's also I think going to be a sort of a value difference between different countries and uh, different systems and so in spite of these different kinds of values and systems what issues are common and what systems are common and how can we work together in order to create a mutual understanding I know that's perhaps not a student grounded as you might think but in my experience the most difficult part is getting these big actors together and getting some kind of common uh, understanding and idea of where we're heading
And I look very much uh, forward to what the ECOL will provide to students and society going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. We will we'll provide, a, a, in reality, new space, new space for experimenting and experimenting uh, in a way that is coordinated by, as I said, the, the OECD that has no vested interest, has, has no investment capacity, but our capacity is just to coordinate the discussion and uh, try, you know, being the pen holder, try to uh, generate uh, knowledge products that benefit uh, the the entire the entire community. Now, let me say something. There was a, a super active uh, uh, chat. I saw it's it's really impressive the number of uh, messages that are popping up uh, from the chat. Uh, we thank you for 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 this interest. Well, I hope that this did not distract you <laughs> in listening the the discussion. Uh, now we will close the chat because we are moving to uh, this uh, a new experiment. Um, as I said. Uh, Ecole uh, is not a club, that, as uh, Lamia Kamalshawi said, it, it, it will not be another network of university, and uh, in reality it will not be a, uh, as a, an homogeneous body uh, of uh, people, of members. Uh, we want to organize our work based on these task and finish groups, in the sense that you have one thing to do, a deadline, and we want to have committed partners instead of members. Uh, so there will not be a list of, of long, a list of uh, members that will, uh, will free ride, etc. No, we want to have uh, people involved in this uh, endeavor that have uh, uh, that they want to to work with us and work work with us thematically. So the work of a call will be organized in three, four task and finish group per year, uh, because otherwise it would be uh, difficult to to manage. And uh, uh, it, it will be uh, topical in the sense that each of these groups will focus on specific issues that have been selected uh, by the members or by the, the communities as relevant. Now, of course, at the beginning, this, uh, the first version of the task and finish groups will be relatively uh, broad in terms of definition. And then we hope to refine very quickly the, the working groups in order to have very very specific uh, you know, uh, knowledge uh, knowledge uh, uh, target uh, uh, to work with. Now I would uh, we have this uh, experiment with uh, Metimeter. I never used that into one of my uh, meetings, so I hope that uh, will work well. The aim is to you can flash uh, this uh, uh, this code, uh, you will be, uh, you will go on a web page and you can identify the most important and the most and the second most important topic that you think uh, it should uh, be the uh, focus of uh, uh, the task and finish groups of ECOL. And, uh, uh, and we have also a, a link in the chat. I saw that, that I tell idea exactly. There is a, there's also a possibility to put a, a link for those that do not have their smartphone uh, with, uh, with them. And then uh, we will see how the, the keywords and the issue uh, uh, evolve. Okay. I will not participate now. Uh, uh, <laughs> I was going to. Uh, no, I, I'm not participating to this uh, to this uh, uh, discussion. But uh, Georgia, are you going to show also the evolution of the, of the cloud? Or yes, uh, I'm doing so now. As as people as people are voting, I will I will start sharing my screen now. Okay. So, so uh, meanwhile. We might we have uh, the possibility to uh, comment a little bit. We we it's uh, it's two thirty now, so it's exactly ninety minutes. We we can have uh, the last ten minutes of, or so of this uh, of this interaction to uh, have some comments from our uh, distinguished uh, 
guests and uh, uh, also to respond to some of the Q&A as identified by my colleagues. Um, is there anyone that wants to have a last word? I don't know, uh, Sheila or this is team, some, some, someone? Georgia, you, you could leave the... I, I was just going to, um, I was just going to say there was a lot of discussion about incentives um, for universities to collaborate, to get involved in entrepreneurship education, to, be, to learn entrepreneurship themselves. And uh, there is an, there is, has been a project in the United States called PTI, P-T-I-E dot org. I put that, that uh, in the chat and they have developed a structure for changing the incentives um, that basically the, the uh, tenure, promotion and tenure system in the United States in order to recognize and reward uh, work of this type. Um, there is a similar kind of effort um, at the University of Minnesota that is focused on engaged scholarship. Um, so um, working with community, focusing your research on um, community-based research. And, um, and so there, this is, um, as Marcus, I think Marcus said, it's very slow to change cultures that are hundreds of years old. But, um, but there is a lot of uh, uh, energy behind this movement to change incentive structures. Uh, Simon, please. I completely agree. I also first want to say that Mentimeter is actually a good example. It's an innovation from uh, my home university uh, because some students were working together on the um, fair for the companies and they realized there was no way they could interact with the audience and now it's a very uh, big company so what we're using right now is an example of what we're discussing so that's very fun uh, I think also it says here the biggest thing is entrepreneurial mindset I just want to add to that that I think you know mindset is important but it's also about real possibilities uh, oftentimes students you know you know you can push an entrepreneurial mindset onto a student but when you don't give them any time to uh, do any kind of uh, entrepreneurial activities um, they just have to study all the time and then as soon as they're done studying they have to go out into the job market otherwise they won't survive you're not really fostering a, a sort of other possibilities of uh, uh, entrepreneurship that's what I mean by saying it's a holistic perspective and also I think it's very important that different student groups come together Marcus was kind of touching upon on that that you know some some students they don't really understand the whole thing when they're given the uh, a more difficult task but my point is perhaps they don't need to because in real life we have different specializations which are very good at different things and where we get true innovation is when these different groups of students meet each other and that's most examples of unicorns and so forth that have developed in Sweden is when different uh, disciplines different kinds of students group have come together in an environment that sort of supports and fosters innovation and there's an entrepreneurial mindset on top of that that's when you get a really big impact Thank, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Simon. Again, in the sense that uh, it's it's about creating uh, this uh, new space uh, and new institutions, new incentives uh, to generate uh, these uh, possibilities, and we will need the help of uh, all of the energies, uh, including uh, students uh, in particular. I don't know if uh, Matthias or, or Tim want also, and Marcus, of course, if there is a. a appetite for a last uh, comment. Hey, Rafael, as I uh, mentioned, um, I'm not quite sure uh, what will come out of this connection, um, but I'm sure there will be something. And when I look into the um, um, FNAs, or Q&As, yes, it's called FNA, uh, I see the last one actually I find rather interesting because um, I always would also like to see robust studies and um, data about things. So it would be also something uh, it's thinking really practical. Um, if you create a platform or share information about benefits or how to build entrepreneurial skills with higher education and business and so forth, so it will become kind of a, well, maybe not um, a knowledge, well, call it a knowledge platform because you don't need to generate anything by yourself, um, but help higher educational institutions, students uh, and ourselves in the business uh, with these kind of things in terms of sharing information and data, best practices, whatever. Um, again, very practical approach, but I'm from the business, so. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Tim. Uh, Matthias, do you want to comment? Uh, uh, Matthias, you're muted. 
just a couple of ideas. Once again, how to promote cooperation among the uh, higher education institutions, I mean, it's key, and how to, to keep track of a very fast moving uh, 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 world in which we are living. I mean, the transformation is huge. Uh, the gaps between the, uh, the, uh, what the uh, society requires and what uh, the universities deliver is maybe increasing, so we need to close that gap. It has huge uh, macroeconomic implications in, in promoting growth. We should be extremely attentive on how to keep trap and, uh, uh, and, and uh, prevent from having uh, people uh, that go through university dissatisfied with their uh, jobs because they are uh, not up to the demands of the market. To keep track of the very fast changing world for me is key in these days. Thank you very much. Marcus, a last uh, comment, uh, and then we move to the Q&A very quickly. Um, look, I think there were some really good comments there. The only thing I was just going to add is, um, I think just on Matthias' last point there, one of the things I'm really hopeful about is that students that are going through universities today have a much more flexible mindset about their futures. Um, I'd love to have some real data, as Tim says, how many students finish up working a career in the degree they actually studied in. Um, you know, by way of example, I'm an astronomer. That's where I came from. Um, and I've ended up in IT and I've ended up in management and other things. And there are so many students going through university now that are studying a degree and all of its detail. And what they end up turning out is, is something else. They have that flexibility. They have that ability to learn. They have that willingness to tackle new problems and so on. So I, I think you know, universities with thousands of years of bad habits um, are turning out students that actually are quite flexible. Th thank you, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Marcus. We will try to do that now. There is, a, there are some questions in the, in the Q and A that uh, I would like to to address, and uh, you know, feel free to 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 intervene as well. Uh, uh, I mean, there is this, this question from Paul Coyle that is really down to earth in the sense: what, when will we hear about more? The, the, the task and finish groups and uh, the opportunity to get involved and make contribution. Uh, thank you, thank you for this question, uh, Paul. The the point is uh, is that we we the a call will will be the mothership. It, it, it will coordinate and host all the activities that we have been doing in uh, like in the geography of our education, our efforts uh, to uh, generate knowledge in entrepreneurship uh, education. Um, so what we envisage is that we have at least already two uh, groups, uh, of course, this, this, this doesn't mean that who is in one group cannot be also in the other. But there is a, a lot of work that we are doing to define entrepreneurship education and start generating an assessment uh, to, to be able to measure uh, the impact of entrepreneurship education. We have started doing that with uh, a, an expert workshop almost two years ago, uh, and we should take uh, now uh, the second workshop in cooperation with the University of Linköping in, uh, in Sweden. Uh, in uh, October, we will start the, the, the series of webinars. You will be informed about that. And I hope that this can trigger the creation of uh, a, a task and finish group. And then there is the work that we have been now doing with the geography of our education, where we look closely at the aspects of uh, the, um, you know, regional development, regional innovation. In that case, there is already a, a review uh, of a geography of our education review of Quebec that will be started uh, uh, very soon. And we hope that a task and finish group can help us develop the idea of this new set of, review, of, of, of reviews, and then that we can launch a series of reviews uh, connected to a call to assess the relationship between the higher education institutions, regional innovation and regional development. And then uh, other smaller, but uh, not less important task and finish groups can be identified based uh, on the ideas that we that you provided uh, us uh, in the Mentimeter. I see, I saw uh, again entrepreneurship mindset, lifelong learning. This idea that uh, is not only students but is also 
the uh, uh, entrepreneurs that get in contact uh, and in, in collaboration with the universities that can benefit from uh, this uh, interaction. And I saw the, 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 the question from Professor Garofoli. Uh, so it, it's all about uh, uh, this. Um, uh, and uh, I don't know if the, the Georgia or Maria have identified some questions that might be asked uh, to our uh, guests, and then we uh, close uh, the, the meeting. One of them, one of, of you. So uh, one of the, the questions is, uh, is how, how can we mainstream entrepreneurship education in, in the curriculum of universities? Um, and how can we, uh, orient this education to the needs of the community. Is there anyone that wants to answer to that? We we, we did already a, a little bit. I don't know if uh, Sheila yes. or... But some last remarks, perhaps. Let's close on that. Simon. I can try. I think talk to those people. Uh, oftentimes, I think we try and guess without talking to each other. The, the best examples of what happens is when you talk to the students, how would you like to uh, involve entrepreneurship within your education and what would you like to do? And then you talk to the surrounding uh, community. What do you need and what are the possibilities? And then you bring that together with the faculty and you make something happen. So just having a dialogue and, and uh, daring to talk to each other, I think, is always the first and the correct step. Thank you very much, Simon. Uh... I, and I would add um, opportunities for externships for faculty to work in companies um, would be an important way for, for faculty to better understand the environment in which companies are working and that would infuse some entrepreneurial thinking among the faculty. Uh, thank you. Uh, if, if I may, th this is a, a very, uh, crucial question because uh, the from the perspective of the current setting we should wait to be able to measure the impact of entrepreneurship education so to be able to mark the results of entrepreneurship education and then offer to students a, 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 a you know a, a program that they are used to uh, or, or at least that the institution is used to. So you go through a program, you take an exam at the end and uh, you receive a mark. The, di the difficult point is that entrepreneurship education because of this idea of mindset and because of this idea of uh, uh, you know, ch changing the culture is very difficult to, uh, to measure. There was a discussion with Eric Sim that I don't know if he's still con connected, but you know, it's, uh, you, you can uh, mark uh, mathematics, but you cannot mark capacity to uh, negotiate uh, with, uh, with people. So it's, uh, it's a little bit complex. We cannot stop entrepreneurship education till the moment that we have that framework for measurement, and probably we will never have that uh, but we need to uh, find an equilibrium in which uh, there is more accessibility to entrepreneurship education. It's not only in business school, it's not only extracurricular activities, uh, and so that all students, or no, all students, uh, a large or a larger amount of students can be exposed to something that we believe can help them as Lamia Kamal Shawi said, vis-a-vis -vis the future of uh, work and, and uh, society. Um, I would, uh, I see that there is uh, also Selim Kaufman, which is our uh, leader, the head of the uh, entrepreneurship uh, SMEs and tourism division with us. I don't know if uh, Selim wants to say something to conclude. No, I just want to thank you all. I think it's been, uh very interesting discussion and I think there's a lot of uh, support and encouraging comments uh, for ECOL. So, you know, going forward, we look forward to continuing involving you in, uh, in ECOL and to have this uh, task and finish uh, groups and uh, other activities of ECOL with all of you. We got a very strong uh, feedback that we need to involve uh, as broader a range of stakeholders as we can. So we we'll go in that direction and uh, thank you very much for contributing to this introduction and discussion of today. And thank you, Raphael and the team for managing this discussion. We can share, right, uh, the, um, 
the exercise that we did and uh, with yes yes uh, absolutely we, we will share all the information uh, possible there will be a, a video recording of this that will probably be on youtube so in your lonely uh, evenings uh, you can be you would be able to see three hours <laughs> 90 minutes of uh, of registration um uh, we will try to produce uh, a, a shorter uh, version of that with uh, uh, the key highlights. Uh, of course, I wanted to say two things. The first is that I look forward to, to, to meet you in person and drink together horrible coffee at uh, <laughs> webinar, seminar, conferences, uh, in, in which uh, discussing the future of a call and uh, in our task and finish groups. Uh, and the second is, uh, I repeat myself, there are already two initiatives that have been identified in terms of measuring the impact of entrepreneurship education and this idea of regional development, smart specialization that will be uh, started in, uh, in, in Quebec. Then we will try to organize uh, other tasks and, and, and finish groups. Thank you for being with us, for having been with us in this first day of a call. Uh, it was, uh, you, you know, a, a, an experiment. Uh, thanks again. I wish you a very uh, good Friday evening, a very good weekend. Uh, those of you that are still interested in football may want to watch some matches uh, in a few hours. Uh, and uh, again, it was a great pleasure to be with you, Alecole.